joined together tonight. I have to confess that uh, at about 10 after six, I looked at my email, I was in my office furiously trying to get a brief done that's due tomorrow. And Lisa Michelle Church had sent me an email saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be there tonight. I thought, where? What, what's she talking about? <laughs> so I hurried and ran home and put together some notes and, and, uh, and my head's fallen off. Our firm joined, uh, joined the largest firm in the, in the world uh, yesterday. We became part of. So now I have 10,000 uh, colleagues in my firm, which is just stupid. But uh, I didn't say, don't anybody say that I said that. Uh, we have another great program tonight. We'll soon be favored to hear from and see Dr. Joe Hatch and Lisa Philip, who's visiting with us. Welcome. Uh, Lisa and some film as only uh, Dr. Joe can make and a lovely PowerPoint from Lisa. And I don't know if Alan Engen's gonna be on the program or not, Joe, but uh, certainly uh, what, part of what Joe's gonna be talking about is about Alan's uh, father and uncle and their uh, creation up Park City Way. Um, why don't we take just a second and introduce people who are get and have members introduce people who are guests or uh, others. Let's just see who uh, is visiting. Write it down for me. Anybody? Nobody. We have no guests. I know we have one. We know we have Lisa. Is there anybody else? Yes, we do. I have my wife with me tonight to listen to uh, Alan. Cool. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, this is Tyler Bond. I've been here a couple of times at the uh, invite of Scott Snow, but uh, I've enjoyed what I've heard over the last few meetings. Thank you. Uh, it, uh, it's I have Casey have... here with me. Hi, Nate. Hey Casey, how are you? Scott, I see you. We've got some corresponding members. One of the one of the uh, I'll mention. I know I mentioned this before. One of the benefits we figured out from the Zoom stuff, which I hope to end uh, in the not too distant future for people who can show up at the Alta Club and and actually have warm bodies sitting together having dinner, breaking bread and enjoying each other, is the realization that we can include. Um, corresponding members by uh, streaming the presentations and we're going to continue to do that uh, after we start joining together personally in Salt Lake City. And the only trick I see institutionally is I don't really want people staying home in Salt Lake and not coming to the meetings in at the Alta Club if they can and we'll figure that out. That's That's not an insurmountable a challenge, but it'll be fun to, to, continue, to, to continue to have um, corresponding members and guests. And the other, the other benefit we found from these Zoom uh, presentations is that we can get people uh, in to speak who uh, we wouldn't think of or wouldn't typically be able to get uh, come speak. Last week, last month's speaker is a good example. We probably never would have had her actually in the Alta Club, and yet we all had a wonderful time. Uh, last month. Um, <clears throat> be sure to read the newsletter. Uh, it's wonderful as always. Steve Berlin does a great job of keeping us informed and, and uh, you know you got a month's worth of reading almost uh, just from all the links and all the materials included. Uh, as I say I was uh, in the midst of trying to figure out how to make effective legal arguments 45 minutes ago and and I need some help to to decide whether we have any uh, announcements, uh, any more announcements. Anyone want to mention anything? We have the election and we have a couple of uh, we, candidates. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for that. That I'm ready for, Steve. Thank you. I'm just not ready for anything else, if there's anything. Steve Gallinson, I saw you with your hand. You have to go off mute. That was the, anyway, uh, we do have another guest that wasn't mentioned. Uh, he's Please. down there, Floyd Hatch. Uh, he's my guest tonight. <laughs> his son is, he's the son of Dr. Hatch, but I'll, I'll claim as my guest tonight. Thank you. 
Floyd and I and Mark Modell were all contemporaries from the same high school. What high school was that, Steve? I love Highland High, Highland High School. Cool. Great. Class of 88. <laughs> when, yeah. when, when Never Ann been the same, to, right? Uh, when Ann and I moved to Salt Lake, uh, we realized that the uh, <laughs> the fashionable high school not to have gone to <laughs> people ask where you went to high school was uh, Provo High, where we both went. <laughs> we were both Bulldogs. Um, I have a good, fr I have two good friends who both have Harvard MBAs. One of them went to West High School. One of them went to East High School. When you ask the one from West High School where he went to, to school, he says, Harvard. When you ask the one who went to East High where he went to school, he says, East High. <laughs> and, and that I learned uh, pretty early that uh, Provo High was not the fashionable place to be an alumnus of if you're living in Salt Lake City. So uh, it's November. And what that means is that we need to elect uh, directors. Um, under our bylaws, we have we have to do that every year. Uh, if you've read the newsletter, you've seen uh, uh, the the um, summary of the process. We have four openings uh, this year. We have we have two uh, wonderful women, uh, Laura Bear and Linda Thatcher, who have timed out. You can only serve two consecutive terms as directors of. Oh, Utah Westerners, and they have both served two terms and now are obligated for at least one year not to serve on the board. We also have, so they're, they're done for now and we'll get them nice parting gifts and we give them extraordinary um, gratitude because they have been wonderful. Uh, Linda mostly overseeing the presentations, getting speakers, scheduling people in. She's done a spectacular job. Laura running the membership and taking on lots of ancillary uh, kind of tasks, which uh, make us uh, much better than we are uh, otherwise. And so let's all give them a hand. Can't hear anybody's hand, but I can see them. Uh, and uh, they're great. In addition, the three, the first uh, three year terms of Steve Berlin and Greg Thompson are done. They are eligible to serve another term happily. They have both agreed uh, to, to stand uh, for election again. They both are interested in continuing to serve on the board. Um, and uh, the board uh, unanimously and heartily and happily uh, endorses uh, their reelection to the board. In addition, we have uh, two uh, nominees uh, for you uh, in Sandra Morrison and Scott Bushman, both of whom have been members for quite a while, are very active, wonderful uh, members of our group. Uh, uh, we sent out uh, information. As you know, Sandra is a wonder at uh, uh, running and curating uh, museums, which she does better than anybody. But Scott Bushman has wonderful background in uh, Forest Service, fire suppression, he's been all over the world doing that. He's also an accomplished artist, <coughs> paints uh, lovely landscapes. And there's more information in the stuff that was sent to you. Uh, in addition, under the bylaws, if uh, either before tonight's meeting or tonight, uh, anyone is authorized to put into uh, nomination a name or two or three or four, of other people to serve on the board. The only stipulation under the bylaws is that whoever is nominated has to agree that they will actually serve. It's one of those things where we, we have the anti, if, if uh, ask, I will not run, if elected, I will not serve. Can't do that. Uh, you can agree not to run in Westerners, but you can't agree not to serve. It's just too important and it's, it's a fun, it's a really fun uh, uh, job, task, service. Jim, uh, so please, Steve. I move we move we close the nominations. Well, and that's and that's good. So, <laughs> is there anyone out there who is interested in nominating anyone other than the four the board endorses and has proposed? 
Hearing none, I will entertain Steve Gallinson's uh, motion that we close nominations. Is there a second? Second. John, thank you. Second. Um, uh, all in favor, say aye. All, all, this aye. is just, this is just the only people get to vote. This is an important, I'm a lawyer, I know. This is an important thing. Only people who are regular members uh, get to vote. Corresponding members, I don't think, are entitled to vote. Visitors certainly are not entitled to vote. So of all of you who are uh, full regular members of Westerners uh, <clears throat> are in favor of closing nomination, say aye. 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 Now we come to the important election and I will tell you this has to be by written ballot and I have no idea. I'm sure I could figure something out uh, through mail or email. I'm happy that we don't have other nominees because it would be a nightmare this year. It is proposed that we uh, elect to a second three-year term of office on the board of uh, on the board of Utah Westerners, Steve Berlin and uh, Greg Thompson, and that we elect to a first three-year term of office on the board, Sandra Morrison and Scott Bushman. All in favor, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. It's unanimous, which means we do not have to have a written ballot and we're done. And thank you very much, Steve Gallinson. You know how to do this. I, I can <laughs> see you've done this a thousand times before. Yes, I have. And uh, Greg's done it more. <laughs> and, and theoretically, <laughs> I guess the only other thing, we're supposed to have a quorum and a quorum is more than one half of our, so we'll figure that out. If we don't, then we'll fudge. We'll uh, ask some other people. We'll, <laughs> we're, we're not gonna do this again, I promise. We have oh. uh, 50 logins, so we're probably good, Ken. I bet, I bet we've got, thank you, Steve, that even better, if we actually meet the required threshold, then makes me uh, happy uh, as, a, as an attorney at law or whatever <laughs> I am. I, you know, my, my wife wouldn't marry me unless I was a lawyer either, and then I wanted to be a historian, so. I don't think that's true. I think she would have been happier if I'd been a historian. So now let's get on to the fun. And uh, Joe, is Pat Hardy here to introduce you? Pat, are you here? You got me. There you are. We're gonna have, so, so we're gonna have some films. We're gonna have a nice presentation from Lisa Phillip, as I understand it. Uh, Pat is going to introduce Dr. Joseph Hatch, and then Dr. Joseph Hatch will introduce Lisa Phillip, and I'm going to turn everything over to you guys to, to pull this off and to wow us and uh, entertain us uh, for the evening. Thank you very much. Pressure. <clears throat> Thank you, Ken. It's uh, my on there. Yeah. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Joseph Hatch tonight. <laughs> Most of you know him, but Joe Hatch is a much more interesting guy than you may realize. He's a highly respected physician, a published historian, an accomplished horseman, a family man, philanthropist, rodeo fan, hunter, golfer, pianist, devoted University of Utah football fan. He continues to practice medicine on a limited basis long after most doctors have retired and hung up the stethoscope, although and he remains a favorite among both his colleagues and his patients, but you may not know that the good Dr. Hatch never graduated from college. You'll have to ask him about that. He <laughs> co-authored two books on Pony Express history and given numerous presentations to civic groups, including Utah Westerners. Joe has a remarkably easy way with people and he can get just about anyone to do just about anything he asks. He's produced several short films, including the ones we'll see tonight, uh, also a, a side-splitting melodrama, and an interesting piece on how bananas are made. Yes, you heard that right. Anyway, above all else, Joe Hatch is the truest of friends, and I'm grateful for that. Also on the program, as Ken mentioned, is, is Lisa Fillerup, and Joe will introduce her, but I promise you'll love her dearly the moment you meet her. Uh, with that, Dr. Hatch, it's yours. Okay, I'll, I'll ask if I'm on. Yes. You hear me? Yes. 
Okay, I, I'd like to start off <clears throat> and uh, mention that we've had important business and uh, I'm glad we've had our wonderful election. I'd uh, ask the uh, grace of our esteemed President Ken Cannon if we might go to maybe 7.15 because I have an hour program here. I won't even wait because I think he's probably nodding his head yes. <clears throat> absolutely, so, Joe. That, absolutely. That's far more important. We just had to do this thing and, and we'll take all the time you need. Okay, well, how pleasant it is for me to Zoom with my Westerner colleagues tonight. The program begins with two documentaries that will run consecutively. They both contain some of my eight millimeter film segments and each tells their story nicely as we watch them. The first one, <clears throat> Remembering Ecker Hill, features Alan Engen, son of Alf Engen, giving an excellent discourse about the place. And why Alan? I can't imagine any, I don't think there's anybody in the world could do what he did for us on this. He knew the people, he jumped on that hill himself. His father, Alf, was a world record setter more than once on that hill. <clears throat> and there's a 1947 <clears throat> eight millimeter black and white film of a jump by Alan's uncle, Corey Engen, shown at regular speed and two different slow motion speeds so that you can better see his beautiful form. It's really nice. It's an old film. It had to be doctored up and photoshopped like heck to get all the dust and stuff out of it frame by frame and it's 16 frames per second so Rich Hale did marvelous work bringing that back. Uh, further background shots show the hill and the jumpers at a 1962 meet on eight millimeter Kodachrome. And your cinematographer was allowed to wander all over the hill in those days, as you will notice. Steve Gallison's drone shows the Secker Hill as it is now. And the Outrun, which is a big green patch, and it's going uphill. And that was a good thing because those guys were really moving when they got to the bottom of that hill. And it's nice to have a little bit of uphill on the Outrun so that they could make their stop. There were no homes in Pinebrook at the time of those earlier movies, not a home and it. It's a very lovely place now. <clears throat> Converting my films to DVD and producing these two documentaries is done by fabulous guy, Richard Hale of Hale Visit Video Services. The second documentary is about Floyd Bjorn Hatch, my brother. He was an amazing man of many interests and abilities. He's a battle veteran of World War II and the Korean conflict. And he kind of went to the University of Utah on and off. He went a little bit and then he went to war with World War II and then he came back and he, he was on and off and he bounced back and forth between law school and the engineering school. Now this Garn Hatch was an industrial engineer and a safety engineer for the Utah Department of Transportation. He was founder and first editor of the Utah Law Review. Are we listening? This engineer was the first editor of the Utah Law Review. And he was also founder and first president of the Tillman D. Johnson Legal Fraternity at the University of Utah. He provided skilled assistance and boundless energies for vital civic interests, particularly saving the Hebrew Utah Tabernacle from demolition. And the third part of our program will be a PowerPoint demonstration and talk by Lisa Fillerup of Heber City. She's a freelance writer and among her achievements, her article in the Utah Historical Quarterly titled Wasatch State Tabernacle, Redefining Pioneers, received the Clarence Dixon Taylor Award from BYU Red, Red, uh, Red Center for Western Studies in 2015. Lisa grew up in Southern California and later went to BYU where she met her husband to be, Peter Villarup, the sculptor. They lived in Wapiti, Wyoming near Yellowstone Park where she blended into the Western culture, earned her degree in English from BYU after years of home study courses, 
and helped manage her husband's growing business. She moved to Hebrew City 15 years after the Hebrew Tabernacle circumstances. <clears throat> she learned from her new friends there about the many faceted, save the tabernacle or not, days and the various energies exerted in many directions by many persons. It's a great story to hear about. Lisa felt that situation to be an historic event deserving of documentation and written record. In doing so, she showed remarkable understanding and sensitivity in producing a needed and accurate report. And your college dropout host, Joe Hatch here. I did get my degree 20 years after I finished medical school, in case that makes anybody feel better about things. <laughs> but I now call upon Richard Hale to open the documentaries to our Zoom viewing pleasure, after which we will see and hear from Lisa Fillerup. It's yours, Richard. Well, my name is Alan Ingen, and I am one of the old guys that's been around skiing for many, many years. Um, I did play a part in the uh, latter years of, of Ecker Hill, and I uh, have a, uh, a father and a couple of uncles that uh, made world marks on that particular facility. This is a hill in the foreground, as if you were going down it like the jumpers do. And that rectangle was the outrun where they skied out of ways and stopped. I think as a starting place, it might be good to point out that not many people know that Ecker Hill probably was the location for the state of Utah that brought worldwide attention to skiing here in this part of the country. And it was because of the world records that were being set on that hill back in the early 1930s. Ecker Hill uh, was uh, dedicated uh, on March the 2nd, 1930, and for the next four, five, six years, every year that they would hold major, major competitions. It, Ecker Hill was considered one of the world's largest jumping hills in its time period. My father uh, set uh, two world records on Ecker Hill. His name was Alf Engen. He set two world records in uh, 1931, both on the same day. He, uh, he eclipsed Henry Hall's record of 229 feet at that time by going 231 feet and then decided to go back up for a second jump and went 247 feet. So in one day, he made two, two world championship jumps, which held for quite a few years. He actually broke the world record a couple of other times, and I should point out that these are professional ski jumping titles that he won, not amateur, because the amateur and the professional were two different things at that time. But Dad actually set another world record of 267 feet and 281 feet on Ecker Hill in, in later years, 
And then following that in 1934, he jumped 296 feet in a jump and unofficially went 311 feet. That is the longest jump, recorded jump, that was ever made on Ecker Hill. It's a little over 300 feet, and that put him right at the bottom of the hill. Ecker Hill has been around uh, for a number of years. It, uh, it faded out in the late 50s, early 60s, and uh, right now, basically, all that's left is it's in the Pine Brook area up at the Summit Park, uh, and there is a historical marker that is located there. And if you go up there, it will have a monument that uh, gives credit uh, to all of the jumpers who jumped on, on Ecker Hill over the years. And it is part of the historical record of the state of Utah. I am very proud to say that I was a part of that, that group and I did know a number of the old jumpers that jumped on the hill. There aren't very many that are still living right now, but uh, those that are uh, do frequent it. Uh, quite honestly, uh, every year I talk to a number of them that are still around and they still enjoy going up to Ecker Hill and taking a look at the facility. Pete Ecker uh, is the person that the Ecker Hill is named after. Pete was one of the primary officials in starting the Utah Ski Club back in the 1920s. And uh, Pete was instrumental in bringing the first professional ski jumping group here to Utah to begin with. He and my father, Alf, were very, very close friends. And my father actually stayed with Pete Ecker when he came into Utah to jump in the tournaments. Pete was an official. He was also a jumper himself in the early days. Uh, I have to say that uh, I owe Pete Ecker the fact that I'm here today because it was through Pete Ecker that that he introduced my mother to my father and uh, that's how they got together in the 1930s and they were married in 1937. Pete was a, uh, a very, very fine and gentle man and uh, I can honestly say that uh, I have fond remembrances of, of knowing him in my early 30 years. The question came up, did my father and I do double jumps together? And the answer to that was yes. We jumped exhibition uh, a number of years. Uh, we jumped uh, some here in Utah, but most of the jumping that we did exhibition wise was in uh, the Los Angeles area of California. We jumped on a large artificial hill and uh, we would uh, jump twice a day, once in the afternoon and once in the evening. In the evening time, why they put in a great big round hoop and lit it with fire, and my father and I would jump through the hoop together. It's kind of the climax to the show every single day. We did that for about a month at a time, and it was part of the LA County Fair every year. Um, we also had tournament jumps that we jumped uh, in, and I can say this, I was probably in my prime at that time, 18, 19 years old, and during the years that I was able to jump with my father in, in competition, I never once beat dad, and dad was, dad was in his uh, 50s, early 60s at the time that he was jumping at that time, so you can pretty much tell what kind of a caliber athlete that he was. He was good all the way up into his, his middle 80s, and, uh, and I, all, I have very, very fond memories of my time jumping with my father. Okay. In competition, when they'd hold the big meets, <clears throat> there were basically only two takeoffs on the hill. They had a B takeoff and then they had an A takeoff. But on special occasions, two or three times during the lifetime of Ecker Hill, they had a third takeoff. And that third takeoff was back about 50 feet further back than the A takeoff. And it was set strictly for one purpose, and that was for my father because my father was trying to break world records at that time so that they would build that third takeoff and he was the only one that would jump that. 
so that it would allow him to go a little bit further as he broke over the hill and he'd go all the way down. He could go further than all the rest of the jumpers. There was only one lady, one lady that, that jumped on Ecker Hill in all the years that we were there, and her name was Johanna Kolstad. She was Norwegian and she was billed as the world champion women's jumper. And she came to Utah one year and she jumped on the B takeoff with my father. She made two jumps and only two jumps, but she jumped double with my father on the, on the B takeoff of Ecker Hill. Ecker Hill was, was a very steep hill to begin with. Okay, it was very, very steep, but it had a very sharp transition, very sharp. And the thing that I always knew <laughs> is that you had to be pretty strong because the gravity, when you got down to, with the force that you were carrying as you went down that hill and you were coming off onto the flat, it felt like it just was pushing you right into the, into the snow. And a lot of jumpers would, would collapse just from the weight of the, of the transition force of going through, that, going through that transition. And that's what pulled a lot of people down right there. Well, the, the, the landing, you, you'd land and you, were, you, know, you were fine, but when it got to the bottom, it just sucked you right into the, into the base. But you know, in a way, that's good. Uh, be, the, the reason why I say it's good is because the old jumping hills were made in such a way that you were very, very high in the air, okay? And coming down, if you weren't on a real steep landing hill, I mean, just the shock of the landing would be enough that you'd get hurt very, very badly. So it took a steep hill to take the take a part of the blow off. Now in the jumping hills, if you go up to Olympic Hill uh, at, at, in Park City and take a look at our Olympic Hill there, you will see the jumpers and they're not more than about nine, 10 feet off the hill at any part in their flight. They just follow the contour of the hill all the way down. It's the way it's designed. So you can go a lot further and not have the crushing blow. Dad, in some of the jumps that I've seen pictures of him, I mean, he's up 60, 70 feet in the air. It's a long way up. And to come down that far, you're, it's like you're, you're coming right down out from a two or three tower of, uh, of a building and, and, and trying to land on concrete because the, it, it took an awful lot of strength. And in the early days, when you take a look jaw at the equipment that was being used. You had long hickory skis to begin with, little toe straps, and they were they were actually bear traps. I mean, once you got your foot in those things, you couldn't come out of them very easily. And the condition, the boots were, 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 were not much. They were more slippers than anything else. And so when you took a look at all of that, what they were dealing with, why it's not hard to understand why there were so many injuries uh, jumping wise in those days. That is why the professional ski jumpers disbanded in about 1936, it was because most of the professionals were hurt so bad they couldn't jump anymore. There was only a few of them left and they couldn't make a, they couldn't make a tour out of it because there weren't enough left that could, could do it.
Why, Mr. Hatch, if this had been a good idea, the faculty would have already thought of it. The law professor chided the law student. Undaunted, the student, a World War II veteran and major, thought, we can do it, and laid plans with his fellow veterans and students to bring a law review to the University of Utah Law School. If they learned one thing from the war, it was that things could be done. Matured by the war, self-confident and assertive, they weren't to be deterred even by a foe as formidable as a law professor or the university bureaucracy. Once we got started, then we really went, Garnhatch, the first editor, said. Those who were returning vets were probably not in the mood to put up with pedagogy. They were used to military training, where the concept was do it. They had become used to feeling it could be done. It was done because in the spring of 1949, the first Utah Law Review was published by this group of returning veterans. And they did it right because after the second year's issue, the university decided to sponsor the publication. Garn Hatch was born January 15th, 1918 in Salt Lake City, Utah, to Floyd F. Hatch and Mabel Lubeck Hatch. His mother died of influenza in 1926. Floyd later married Donette Lloyd in Paris, France on March 27, 1927. He received artillery training in the University of Utah ROTC, where they used horse-drawn artillery. The same horses were also available to the cadets for use as polo ponies. His best friend and cousin, Glenn Hatch, shared these same experiences with him. He was a volunteer officer during 1941 through 1945, where he was an artillery forward observer, a sensitive position of more than unusual danger. He chose to remain in Darmstadt, Germany, with the occupation forces to help ensure proper post-war transition. Later on, from 1951 to 1954, he volunteered to serve in the Korea conflict as well. He retired as a colonel in the Army Reserve with a total of 15 battle stars and the Bronze Star. Garn's University of Utah experience is fascinating because of his time as a student in the College of Law between wars. He was a founder and president of the Tillman D. Johnson Inn, a Phi Delta Phi legal fraternity. He was also founder and first editor of the University of Utah Law Review. The first issue included special articles by Tillman D. Johnson himself, plus a landmark article on Colorado River water by Edward Clyde. He graduated from the University of Utah with a degree in industrial engineering. His ability and enthusiasm as an editor and organizer continued in his profession, where he edited two engineering periodicals and was organizer and coordinator of the historic American engineering record, recording and drawing historic sites in Utah, such as the Luce and Dressel. the Big Bend Railroad Bridge over the Weaver River, the Salt Lake Tabernacle Dome structure, the Hurricane Canal, the multiple arch dam structure at Mountain Dell, the Utah Copper Pit, Kennecott, the Magnolia Refinery and Smelter, and the Tula Smelter. He also was co-organizer of a statewide graduate degree engineering program for practicing engineers. Garn was a missile engineer at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California, 
and Sperry, Utah Corporation. He served with distinction at the Utah Department of Transportation as a safety engineer. Garn's amazing impact in community involvement is among the brightest stars in his crown of achievements. The historic Heber Tabernacle would not exist today if it were not for Garn Hedge. He energized the Heber City, saved the tabernacle effort, and generated a significant part of the funding that was necessary to purchase an alternate site for Heber's new stake center. Heber City letterhead stationery shows a drawing of the tabernacle. It served for years as the Heber City office building. After this major effort, and in order to protect other historic structures, Garn became principal founder and honorary life member of the Utah Heritage Foundation. Garn organized and served as president of the Mormon Trails Association and was honored for his efforts in Washington, D.C. by the National Center for Recreation and Conservation. From this base, he secured the cooperation of many organizations, including the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, state governments along the trails, private landowners, and Native Americans. He loved wilderness backpacking, high country horsebacking, he could throw a beautiful diamond hitch on that horseback and alpine skiing. He was always interested in the Boy Scout movement. In May 1998, Garn received the prestigious University of Utah Emeritus Merit of Honor Award. He was truly a man of energy and accomplishment, driven to help bring lofty goals to fruition. Joseph L. Hatch, brother, November 4th, 2015. Lisa, fill her up, it's your time. Lisa, unmute your microphone. Okay, can you hear me now? Steve, yes, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Great. Okay, I might, I might need you to invite me to share my screen. Yeah, Craig will do that for you. Oh, okay. Uh, I already have it so that you can share screens. Okay, I just don't know if you can see what I'm seeing. I just see you, but... <laughs> but I can, have you see, those... can you see the tabernacle? No. No. I, I have uh, it set up so multiple participants can share simultaneously, so it should, it should work. So Lisa, share your screen, and when you can see the tabernacle, we will too. Okay, hold on. Okay, we're good. Okay. There we go. All right, thank you. I'm an English major, <laughs> not very technologically savvy, but thank you, it's nice to be with you tonight. Um, I can, I can testify to Pat Hardy's comment about Joe getting people to do things, amazing things, and I guess that's why I'm here tonight, and I, I appreciate your um, presentation, Joe. That was fabulous. 
I'm grateful for this opportunity and especially to be among such a distinguished group as the Westerners Association. And I just want to qualify something, but I, I am no historian, but I do love history. And I think that our past is filled with remarkable stories that, that inspire us to the greater good and help us understand who we are. And so I'm grateful to be able to present one such story tonight. The Wasatch Stake Tabernacle, completed in 1889, stands today as a monument to the religious devotion of 19th century pioneers, as a symbol of the tenacity of a group of local women more than a half a century ago who fought to save it from destruction, as well as an example of the dedication of a more recent generation to maintain the tabernacle's use as the Heber City Hall. The struggle to save the tabernacle was a passionate one. The year-long fight would divide the town of Heber, Utah, as no other issue ever had. One resident described the feeling in the town as a battlefield, divided by who was for and who was against. Eventually, the issue would be taken to the highest councils of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And ultimately, the battle to save the tabernacle would become a story of determination and courage, forgiveness and faith, whose outcome would influence the architectural heritage in the state and within the worldwide church itself. The use of tabernacles in church culture had its roots in, old, in the Old Testament. In Exodus, references are made to tabernacles as being sanctuaries of the spirit. Isaiah also prophesied that tabernacles would be part of establishing Zion in preparation for the second coming of the Savior. So tabernacles were used for worship in many Latter-day Saint communities. Built by the people using donated labor and materials, they became labors of love as well as evidence of their devotion to build the kingdom. By the 1920s, tabernacles had evolved into multi-purpose buildings used for school, schools, gymnasiums, and cultural centers. Eventually, stake centers would assume the roles that tabernacles had once filled. But the old buildings remained beloved by their respective communities. And I think we've seen this same attitude evidence in the renovation of several pioneer temples lately, and especially the iconic Salt Lake Temple. In 1877, the population of Heber Valley necessitated the organization of a church stake, and Abram Hatch was called to serve as stake president. Ten years later, he realized the need for a tabernacle in the Wasatch Stake, which numbered 2,296 souls in 18 wards that took in Summit, Uinta, and Wasatch counties. Hatch, a man of energy and resources, not only farmed, but operated a mercantile, established a canal system in the, in the valley, and founded the Heber Bank, all while serving for 23 years in the territorial legislature. In what would become the crowning jewel of the valley, the tabernacle construction began in 1887. Hatch rallied church members of all ages to be part of erecting the tabernacle. The building took two years to complete and was built entirely using donated labor and materials at a cost of $30,000. Alex Forty was the architect and Hatch served as superintendent. The tabernacle was constructed of red sandstone from the quarry in Lake Creek, five miles east of town. And it's where Red Ledges is now today, which is kind of fun. Handmade rugs were laid down the aisles and batches of homemade soap were made from lye and animal fat to bleach the wood floors and create a shine that resembled varnish. Coal oil pendants hung from the ceiling for light. When the building was dedicated in 1889, the local paper noted, conference visitors were expected to wipe their feet before entering and encouraged to leave their knives and tobacco at home. The building was filled that day with 1,300 people, the largest ever assembled under one roof in the town. 
The original, original tabernacle floor plan had a large entrance foyer that opened into a large assembly room. Balconies lined three sides of the hall and were supported by large round posts. During the winter, there were four large pot belly stoves in each corner of the room. And according to Jesse Bond, who was the janitor for over 30 years, it made no difference whether the fire needed to be stirred or the coal added during a sermon, the task was always tolerated. A winding staircase led to the bell tower where a stately bell would announce the time for church and town meetings. Alert the fire department and ring long and slow for a funeral procession. The tabernacle was also the hub of theatrical productions, community events, and high school graduations. One Heber resident remembers going to the tabernacle to hear popular church leader Jay Golden Kimball speak. He remembered, there were so many people eager to see him and hear him, they even sat two and three to a windowsill. According to another longtime resident, everything big that happened in Heber happened in the tabernacle. But the many years of heavy use began to take a toll on the once majestic landmark. By the 1960s, the 75-year-old structure was slipping into derelict condition. During state conference, people complained of dodging drips from the ceiling during a rainstorm. For the leadership of the valley, it was a stinging reminder that something needed to be done. The tabernacle was not only in disrepair, but it was impractical, with no office space for the stake presidency. Then stake president J. Harold Call and his counselors, Wayne Whiting and Ralph Carlisle, had to hold their meetings in the seminary building, which was several blocks away. On a Sunday morning session of the Wasatch State Conference, June 21, 1964, President Call announced his decision to replace the tabernacle with a new modern stake center. He carefully laid out the history leading to his decision, emphasizing that it had involved several years of careful study. But after the announcement, it soon became clear that the local church leaders underestimated the tidal wave that would follow. Almost immediately, a flood of letters poured into Call as well as to the secretary of the First Presidency or of the church urging their leaders to reconsider. Sitting in the congregation that day was a recent widow by the name of Ruth Witt. Stunned over the decision, Witt invited a small group of women to meet in her home a few days later to see what they could do. Witt, a woman of determination and leadership, would prove to be the driving force behind the long struggle to save the tabernacle. She had married into one of the oldest families in the valley and felt passionate about saving the building she felt symbolized her pioneer heritage. Barbara McDonald, a mother of six small children, suspended giving afternoon piano lessons to serve on the newly organized Save the Tabernacle Committee. Inspired by a profound reverence she felt for her hometown tabernacle in St. George, McDonald described the experience as the defining moment of her life. When McDonald asked her mother whether or not to get involved, her mother responded, if not you, then who? Hope Moore and Beth Ritchie, sisters who herit whose heritage was linked to Heber's earliest days, also formed that first foundational effort. Witt and her committee began by composing a letter to the First Presidency of the Church, as well as scheduling a meeting with Kate Carter, president of the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers, who had arranged a meeting with presiding bishop Robert L. Simpson. As the women filed into Simpson's office, he asked, where are your husbands? Then with a mild reprimand, he said, women shouldn't be trying to do these things on their own. They should have their husbands beside them. Nevertheless, he did make two suggestions. Request a 30-day extension of the demolition date and get a petition with President Call's name on the list. 
By the first week in August, the newly formed committee had gathered 657 signatures, with Harold Calls being one of them. With proof that there was support in the Valley for keeping the tabernacle, an extension date of September 12th was agreed upon. Witt's committee launched into a vigorous publicity campaign, running full page, a full page, page spread in the Wasatch Wave. They arranged a meeting with a journalist from the Provo Herald, contacted Everett, Everett Cooley of the Utah yeah, Historical yeah, Society, sure. and even sure. managed the spot Sounds on the Channel 4 News. As the press became more involved, Call paid a visit to Everett Cooley's office, telling him that the Utah Historical Society had no business getting involved in what he felt was a local matter. The confrontation sent Cooley straight to Grant Iverson of the State Historical Society and friend of, and neighbor of Hubie Brown, who was currently serving as counselor to then president of the church, David O. McKay. Four days before the September deadline, Witt, McDonald, Moore, and Ritchie showed up in President Brown's office with an expanded petition of 1,366 signatures. In a county whose total population was 5,308, President Brown could not help but take notice. Brown advised the women to find an alternate site for the new stake center and to quote, get some responsible people here to talk it over and make arrangements. The women clearly understood that they were to get some men in charge. Paul was an attorney by profession and had a reputation, as one friend put it, of being a little short on tact and, and diplomacy. Although there were those who bristled at times with Call's manner, Many described him as a dedicated and honest servant who was determined to provide a modern and practical place to worship. Following an uncomfortable meeting with Call, Beth Ritchie called President Brown at home and relayed the conversation. Interestingly, Brown had just hung up the phone after talking to President Call, who had referred to the women on the committee as fanatics who were trying to overthrow priesthood authority in the Valley. Ritchie pressed for another extension of the deadline and the committee was given one more week. Acting on President Brown's suggestion, Witt enlisted a group of businessmen to head the committee. Glenn Hatch, the great grandson of Heber's first stake president and cousin to Joe, accepted the role of chairman. The Witt and her committee followed Brown's counsel to find responsible people to help, and the new committee added strength to the fight. The women continued to power the movement to save the tabernacle. But their involvement had without a doubt created a stir. A saying began circulating in the valley that the petticoats were ruling the priesthood, implying that women were overstepping their bounds in challenging church authorities. In many ways, the women found themselves nose to nose with church hierarchy in ways they'd never imagined. The fight to save the tabernacle not only challenged gender roles, but questioned the faithfulness of church members who supported the cause. Those who supported saving the tabernacle were seen by some members of the church as rebels, not strong enough in the faith. As a result, the majority of church leadership in the valley fell in line with Carl's decision to raise the tabernacle, but McDonald recalls many people in church hierarchy would privately say to her, I can't support you, but we hope you're successful. The week extension grew into several as negotiations sputtered forward and slowed to a crawl. On October 6, 1964, the stake presidency proposed an alternate site for the stake center at a price tag of $60,000. The committee gulped hard at the price, but flew into action. They distributed flyers requesting donations, spent hours on the phone soliciting support, and kept journalists privy to their efforts. But the what year was this? 64. By the end of the week, the committee had added $2,000 to the pot, but it was a drop when they needed a downpour. Then suddenly, Call received a letter from the First Presidency dated November 20th, 1964, 
giving him permission to move forward with the original plans to raise the stake building. Interestingly, Call kept the letter nearly a month and mulled over what he could have considered a free pass for a new stake center and ended all negotiations. Instead, he waited nearly a month before making the letter public. Fearing it was the end, Witt drafted a letter to President Brown explaining the decision to raise the tabernacle was based on erroneous information and requested an impartial investigation of the issue. As the new year began, the committee waited on edge for, for a response from church headquarters. With nearly $10,000 raised toward the fund and the city willing to take title to the property, the committee had made considerable progress but still had only a fraction of the amount needed. During this time, Grant Iverson lamented, this has to succeed because it is the first. If we lose this one, we will lose them all. Witt recorded in her journal her fears that the outcome over the tabernacle would foster anger and resentment, even rebellion and dissension. The state, state will be so divided that it will never be united in our lifetime. By mid-January, the battle for the tabernacle had reached such intensity that the First Presidency sent Apostles Marion G. Romney, Thomas S. Monson, and Howard W. Hunter to assess the situation. The Apostles interviewed 16 people, including Witt, McDonald, Ritchie, and the Heber Stake Presidency, and Wasatch County Commissioner Walter Montgomery. The investigation resulted in the conclusion that the tabernacle block on Main Street was not the ideal location for the new stake center. A four month extension of June 30th, 1965 was given the committee to come up with the remaining funds. In the months that followed, the committee edged closer to making the deal. They were given a boost when the city sent a letter to President McKay expressing interest in the tabernacle property then, without explanation, on May 19th, President Call received a letter from the First Presidency again, giving him permission to raise the old building. In shock and disbelief, the committee met and drafted a letter. Then they all piled into cars and drove down to church headquarters in Salt Lake, where they hand-delivered their letter to President Brown, who seemed almost surprised at their persistence. At first, he said there was nothing he could do, but then he read the letter and looked up at the room of expectant faces and said, well, I've stuck my neck out for you before. I guess I could do it again. Then he good humoredly called them a rebellious group to which Ruth piped up. President Brown, if there hadn't been groups like us, there would never have been a United States of America or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The previous extension was honored by church officials in Salt Lake City. A month before the deadline, BYU professor Hugh Nibley wrote an impassioned article in response to the tabernacle fight, reminding people that the remnants of our pioneer culture are fast draining away. Consider the money, time, and energy that will be extended this year in celebrations commemorating the struggles of the pioneers in elaborate and costly make-believe while the last remnants of their actual toil and faith will be undergoing systematic de destruction to save a few dollars. Early in June, the Heber City Council came forward and offered to sell a piece of property along Midway Lane and donated the $23,000 received to the Tabernacle Fund. The committee met with the stake presidency and the city council where Mayor R.N. Giacoletti accepted title and responsibility for the maintenance of the exterior of the building. The Save the Tabernacle Committee agreed to maintain the tabernacle's interior. In the end, the future of the tabernacle hinged on hundreds of individuals stepping up in various ways. The majority of individuals who contributed did so with modest contributions, many as little as $5. A group of actors from Park City heard about the deadline just days away and donated the proceeds of a night's performance. The Hatch family, descendants of Abram Hatch, many of whom no longer lived in the valley, 
came forward and pledged a generous sum and made the difference. And Garn Hatch was the facilitator of that transaction. On a hot July evening, July 4th, actually, 1965, a special priesthood meeting was called for all the male membership in the valley. President Brown was presiding and conducting at the meeting, showed up without a coat and just a shirt and tie. Church leaders likewise peeled off their coats. It was said to be the, the best attended meeting in the history of the valley. For nearly an hour, Brown related stories while everyone squirmed. Then he finally prefaced the announcement everyone had come to hear. Stressing there would be no discussions about it, he said the first presidency had decided that the beloved tabernacle would be saved, which he added is what he had hoped all along. Five years later, in 1970, the tabernacle was listed on the State Register of Historic Sites, and the following year it was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Witt was also recognized that same year by the Utah State Historical Society for her efforts in saving the tabernacle. The struggle to save the Wasatch Tabernacle awakened the need for historic preservation within the community, state, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. One of the most influential results was the formation of the Utah Heritage Foundation in 1966, which became the first statewide preservation organization in the Western United States. Once the tabernacle was secured, it seemed only time would heal the wounds incurred during the past turbulent year. Barbara McDonald felt the effects of her involvement when in 1970, she applied for a job at the new Wasatch County Hospital, and she was told that they weren't hiring troublemakers. As a result, she was forced to commute out of, out of the valley for work. One important and tragic event did more to heal the wounds over the tabernacle than time ever could. 18 months after the tabernacle decision, an automobile accident took the life of President Call's wife, Helen. News of the tragedy literally rocked the valley, and in the days that followed, many hearts were softened and grudges set aside. Compassion, as one resident remembers, was literally poured out on President Call and his family. In the 20 years that followed, volunteers pitched in to keep up with the extensive repairs the tabernacle required. But theatrical production staged in the tabernacle never seemed to be profitable enough to keep up with the maintenance and repairs on the building. By the early 1980s, the tabernacle was for the most part empty, but for the bats that inhabited its interior. Once again, the future of the tabernacle seemed tenuous. For 20 years, Witt had been devoted to the maintenance of the building. And this picture shows, if you can see it, I hope it's not too small, Ruth is up on that, on that um, balcony, and then her son-in-law, Lloyd Provost, is up on the highest part of it above the bell tower cleaning. And Ruth was in her 70s during this time up there and still taking care of things. Witt also served on the Board of Trustees for the Utah Historical Heritage Foundation, but after a serious car accident in 1984, she was forced to limit her involvement in, on both the committee and the maintenance of the building. But when Witt's health failed her, there were those who picked up where she left off. Robert McCormick, a retired engineer, took an interest in the building, inspected it and found it stable, but in immediate need of repair. At the time, Heber City was in need of new offices and plans were set in motion to refurbish the tabernacle for the mayor and city council. In a historic bond election, Heber residents unanimously voted to issue $350,000 in bonds to restore the tabernacle for use as, as a new city hall. It was the first time a bond had ever been approved, the first time it was presented to the Heber citizens. Once hailed as the historic heart of the city, the Wasatch State 
stake tabernacle underwent extensive interior and exterior renovation. Offices were created and a second floor added. Portraits of Heber's early pioneers were collected and hung in gilded frames. And lying the walls of the building, glass cabinets were installed to house historic artifacts, period clothing, photographs, books, and mem mementos. On May 5th, 1989, the 100-year anniversary of the completion of the tabernacle, the remodeled building was rededicated as home to the Heber City offices. The story of the tabernacle in Heber is a testimony to the intrinsic value of our architectural heritage and the belief, as James Mortimer suggests, that men and women of every generation are pioneers, driven by dreams to find a wilderness, some place, some achievement, or some task that is still unfound, unimagined, or forgotten. Thank you. I don't, I don't know who has the microphone. Are there any know, questions? Yeah. So, um, uh, Joe and Jill, are you re are you willing to entertain questions? Of course. I you know I had an I had an idea, Joe. Let's uh, so everybody. Um, th this is, is is sort of controlled chaos. But if you have questions, just kind of let's just try to be courteous with each other, asking questions. You know, taking turns asking questions. This isn't a question, but I have a, a comment or a memory. I was, I was employed at the Salt Lake Tribune at the time of this tabernacle battle. And I remember vividly the daughter of the editor, Art Deck, was Stephanie uh, mm -hmm. Churchill. And I think she was the first uh, executive director of the Heritage Foundation. Uh, when the word got to her father that the tabernacle was being considered for destruction, the Tribune went way overboard in its articles and comments and, and, and photos of why it's important to preserve the, the tabernacle. This was aside from the Tribune's editorial stands. These were, these were comments and photos and, 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 and quotes that were in the news hole, uh, the news section of the, of the paper. And as we found out from the wonderful presentation by Lisa, I, I hope, I suppose, that some of that helped uh, sway the church hierarchy. Joe and Lisa, is the Abram Hatch home still standing up there? <laughs> yes, it yes, it is. It was a Zion bank, and then Zion needed to expand their space, and they built another building on the same block, but west, and, but the home is still standing. It's a beautiful building. Yeah. Questions? Joe, what? I have a question for you. It was some of that footage that you had um, of the Ingans, was that you were there, actually there watching? What was this? This is addressed to you. To whom? This is to you, Joe Hatch. Okay. <laughs> Was were you were you present when so, when the those the Ingans were jumping and was that footage that you had taken with your camera? Well, that was jumpers. Uh, there was no oh. no ethnic question about it. It was Joe Hatch, and it was with a camera and a tripod. Okay. Steady shots, and I was all over the hill, and. Uh, <clears throat> And interestingly, I don't know if some of them noticed, but Garn Hatch shows they're going up those steps carved in the snow. So there's a little cameo of my brother. <laughs> a little bit like Alfred Hitchcock would throw in a cameo of himself in some of his stuff. That was great. Lisa, this is John Taylor. Um, I was present when you made your original presentation at BYU a few years ago. 
and uh, <laughs> subsequently I, I made a trip up to Hebrew to take a look at the building and have gone up several times since. I have never yet found the building open. So apparently its use as a metropolitan facility didn't last long. Can you tell us about that? Well, um, depending on when, when you came up, and thank you for your question, I, um, I know it's open during the week from eight to five, the Tabernacle, and they have offices there. I'm not sure when you pay to visit, but that's my understanding. And, and I, have, I have gone and they have, they have quite a bit of um, historical information there about the Tabernacle. And I have gone during working hours and always found someone there. So I guess I'm not sure if I know the well, answer to that. I'll try again. But is it being used at the present time by the city for their various offices? It is. It is currently in use. Thank you. What was the relation of Abram Hatch and Jeremiah Hatch, founder of Vernal? Abram Hatch is the brother of Jeremiah Hatch. And um, the uh, founder of, well, Logan and Southern Idaho is another brother. Oh. There were three brothers, and they had some marvelous sisters. We never hear about them. I <laughs> wish we knew more about those ladies, because they were very outstanding also. <clears throat> I, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I have a question about the Summit State Tabernacle in Colville, which was demolished in 1971. So a year later was the community of Colville not as dedicated? I, I, I understand that it happened at like four o'clock in the morning, so nobody knew locally that it was happening until it was too late. Yes, they, they were just, um, just forming a committee, and, and as I understand it, there, there are records down in Salt Lake of the stake president that ordered that to be destroyed and he um, called in a crew. Many of the men were on the high council and they, um, in the dark of the early morning, um, tore down the tabernacle because he didn't want to happen what he felt had happened in, um, in Heber. Which is very, very sad and that, that building was a a replica of the um, assembly hall on Temple Square. It was just absolutely beautiful. They had they had windows that were imported from Belgium, and three beautiful large portraits of the three witnesses that they were able to save. And at least they had the presence of mind to do that. <laughs> Four more paintings they didn't save, though. Pardon? I think there were probably a lot more paintings that they didn't save. Yeah, that could be. The, the, Brad, the one, Brad uh, speak to us. Brad. Oh, I could add a few bits about this. When I interviewed Richard Jackson, Richard Woolley Jackson, uh, he uh, became a uh, complete preservationist and, uh, and he repented for what he had done previously. But in my interview that I did with him, he described how there was a very tactical effort to avoid what happened in Heber and uh, that uh, uh, they thought they had learned their lesson. So I, I think it had a direct impact on the preservation of that building. The mm -hmm. one success uh, prevented the other one. Uh, but Richard Jackson described how he felt very badly if he had had the same preservation ethic he had later in life, he would have done something about that. But it, was, um, it also informed the church a lot about buildings thereafter. Uh, they worked very hard at kind of doing five-year plans in such a way that by the time people learned about it, it had the decisions and the communities were already moved out of the buildings. But that building, as you said, was the beginning of the Heritage Foundation and the beginning of the preservation movement in Utah. So it's a fascinating presentation. I'm so glad to hear it. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It was really interesting to interview these people and get their perspective after 40 years or 50 years 
and how they, you know, there were people that regretted their stance. Yeah, it was my understanding at the Colville one that women actually went down to the church office building to argue their case too, but they were turned away. Yeah, yes. I remember, I remember that architects from, uh, LDS architects from Salt Lake went there and, and, uh, and um, demonstrated about its possible demise. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, uh, that uh, turned a lot of heads in the community towards thinking about preservation. Mm -hmm. More yeah. questions? I have a question for or a, uh, a, a request of Alan Ingen. Alan, it's Greg. Um, talk about the role your uncles and your father played in the construction of Ecker Hill and why that location was chosen and who chose it. Good. Am I coming through okay? Yeah, you are. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the history of Ecker Hill goes back to around, around the early 1930s. Uh, what brought the professional ski jumpers to Utah was jumping on another big hill up in Ogden called Becker Hill. Mm -hmm. If anybody remembers that, uh, uh, Becker was a Bear Baron, and the name the name of the hill was named after him. Becker Beer. And so the professional jumpers came here in 1929, 1930 to jump on on Becker Hill. <coughs> At that time, up in uh, up in the Farley's Canyon area, there was another little hill called Rasmussen Hill, and uh, they held uh, they held small jumping events up on on uh, Rasmussen Hill uh, during the early 1930s. And from that, they went right around the corner and decided that they wanted to build a bigger hill, which was uh, then put in as, as the large Ecker Hill. Uh, my, uh, my father initially did not play an active role in the initial construction of Ecker Hill, but my uncle, Sveri Engen, did. He stayed behind in Utah while the other professional jumpers went on the tour and he stayed behind and worked with several of the other professional jumpers in putting the initial formation of Becker Hill together. But uh, in later years, uh, my father did come back several times and worked with the scat skinner on, uh, on doing other, other finishing, finishing to the Ecker Hill. And this was probably in the 1933, 1940 timeframe. If you, uh, if you go to uh, the ski archives, Greg can probably show you some photos of my father on the cats uh, working on that hill at that time. So it did have several periods where the, uh, where the hill was under construction and, uh, and it had a, a very, very fine history to it. Alan uh, yes. or G Joe, um, what, what led to the fact that uh, it's never been bulldozed down and it was able to be preserved? How, how did that work out? It was steep. <laughs> I, I think yeah. it just wasn't a place you could put a house on or near. Just chance? Well, the, 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 the truth of the matter is, is it always was looked upon as a historic site because it was kind of the start of where some of the, where the first international events were held here in Utah. So everybody knew that it had a historic relevance to it. But in 1986, uh, there was a, a new dedication that was made at Ecker Hill, and that was when it was put on the historic register. Um, in later years, during the late 1980s, early 1990s, there was some vandalism that occurred up there. And the initial sign that was made for Ecker Hill was damaged tremendously. And so the the thought was, well, we need to do a reconstruction of the monument up there. And Greg Thompson and myself and a number of others were part of a group that put the new dedication 
uh, monument in place on September the uh, 1st, it was dedicated of uh, 2001. And Greg and myself and Jake Garn and a few others were the featured speakers up there at that time. It has a very highly rated uh, history and the old sign, which was damaged, now resides in the Olaf Engen Ski Museum at Olympic Park. And who owns the property? It's part of the uh, Pinebrook uh, property up there, and they maintain it and, and keep it there. Uh, I'm one, sorry, Alan, I didn't hear. Who did you say did it? Who owns it? it, it it's under the Pinebrook development up there. It's part of their property. It's like a park, isn't it? It's just a. It is. If you if you notice the the uh, uh, the, the shots that Steve Gallinson took with his uh, with his little machine looking over Ecker Hill, you notice down at the very bottom it's grassy down there, and so that that's all come in in later years, and it's very very nice. You can go up there and sit on the grass in the summer, and <clears throat> uh, like it was already mentioned, you can go and see the monument there, and you can see the names of all of the jumpers who participated on Ecker Hill. But Alan, that grassy part is the outrun, isn't it? Where they ski on yeah. out and come to a stop. That's the that's the flat. Yeah, that's the flat part. That's where you come out after the transition that came out on the on the flat area. And, and nicely going uphill a little, which helps to making the stop also. A little bit, yes, that's true. <laughs> Alan, that how cool? how big a role, or what part did uh, Park City? jumpers play in the Ecker Hill development because, you know, Otto Carpenter and Mel Fletcher and a bunch of them used to ski on Ecker. And we had jumps in Park City off some of the old uh, mine tailing dumps, uh, Creole Hill and uh, up Diamond Hollow and a number. So that was really in, in vogue in the early 40s. You're so Park City Group did play a big part in a lot of the uh, a lot of the history of Ecker Hill. Uh, most of the jumpers coming out of Park City were not considered the professional A-class jumpers, so that they really did not jump too much on the A-hill, but they jumped on the B-hill a great deal. Yeah. Mel Fletcher is one of the big names, of course, in Park City right now, and He's in our Ski Hall of Fame, but uh, Mel jumped here for, for many, many years and played a very, very active role. And uh, whenever Dad went to, uh, to Park City to jump on uh, Creole Hill, why it was Mel that he worked through to, to make that event happen. Thank you. And Lisa, that was super uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Was, uh... There's another thing about the Eckers. We sort of talk about who Pete Ecker was here, but Pete Ecker had a wonderful camera store in Salt Lake City on Main Street, yeah. almost yeah. as far south as Third South on the west side, and his sons Ray Ecker and Harold Ecker were there. Harold did more portrait photography, and Ray did all sorts of interesting stuff, and I know that he did a lot of 16 millimeter movie photography in the sewers of Salt Lake City. Heaven knows where that footage, <laughs> footage was and what they did, but that's Pete Ecker. He took my high school annual picture for East High in 1946, oh. 1945. Pete that, himself. That store was there for a long time. Yeah, and a great place. Yeah. So well, well, I have, go ahead. I have a question. I'm interested in knowing uh, what the church's uh, current policy is about their old buildings. I, I'm thinking of a couple of instances. Uh, Scott Bushman's here with us. You know he lives in Hiram, and there's a building up there next to Scott right there on his street that's an old chapel that's now a home of his neighbor. Actually, he's living in the home, and I thought that was interesting. Yet there was another building in that small town that was um, next to his friend Ted that was considered for, I mean, it was a wonderful, beautiful, almost Victorian styled uh, LDS chapel. And I think it was 20 years ago or so that, that it was torn down. Um, I had heard at that time, I think Scott and I had some discussions about whether or not the church was concerned about any buildings that were theirs if they sold them, that they couldn't control them anymore, you know, in terms of their use, if they were to continue to be used. I'm wondering what the church 
uh, currently their attitude is, or if the, the Heritage Foundation is working closely with, a, and maybe we're past that apex where the old buildings are either saved or they're gone. But I'm curious to know if anyone has any thoughts or uh, answers to that question. You know, do you know when uh, I was on the, Brad Westwood got me on the Heritage Foundation board in the late 1980s and I was on for a few years till we moved to New York for a while. But um, Mike Leventhal, who was the director of the Heritage, and, and it's really fun for me, Joe, to hear that, that Garn was, was the impetus behind the creation of that. Well, so one, it was a wonder, it's not called the Heritage Foundation anymore. I don't remember what it's called, but. Preservation Utah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but Mike Leventhal and I uh, helped persuade the church to uh, sort of save the Vernal Tabernacle by converting it into a temple. Uh, and, you know, it's not a perfect, it's not a perfect resolution, but at least it saves the exterior of the building. You know, as a as a kid from Provo growing up there with the Provo Tabernacle, which was an extraordinary a building and was really a community center as much as it was a church building. I, you know, I was very, you know, I never liked the center tower on that building and they put it back and, and I would have loved to have seen it restored as a tabernacle. I mean, it's where, I, it's where my high school graduation exercises uh, were. Um, you know, so I, I think it's still kind of mixed. Scott, it, it's, uh, you know, and all that years ago at this point, I have no idea what the current view of the world is. Brad, do you know more about that? I, I could say a few things. Emily Utt is the preservation officer for the LDS Church, and she has done phenomenal things. When, when I was a part-time preservation officer in the 90s for the LDS Church, um, we hadn't a plan, we didn't do anything systematically, she has created and is updating, uh, in the new year, they're going to be updating their preservation plan. I met with her and her director about three weeks ago because I took a tour of a whole lot of buildings in Sugar House and the neighborhoods are the, the oldest um, 20th century subdivisions. And there's, as everyone knows, surely the demographics of Salt Lake City has shifted non-Mormon. And so there's a good 15 incredibly unique buildings, all built in the early 20th century that are embedded in beautiful neighborhoods. And so I took a meeting with them just to ask what's going on with those buildings. And they were very cordial and they just said they're working very hard to come up with not your standard planning, and try to be preemptive and assist the church in working out new uses. You know, uh, I, I, oh, I was I just going to say, Emily. I, 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 the church I go to is the tw old 27th Award on the corner of Peace Street and and Fourth Avenue near where Peter uh, used to live, and you know it it was built in 1904. It's a lovely uh, old style building, and uh, and it was saved. Uh, in reaction to the Colville debacle. Mm -hmm. And um, and two or three years ago, they closed the church for a year and, and did a, you know, the chapel is spectacular. And I kept hearing stories about this, this just fierce woman who was overseeing the, the, the renovation of the 27th Ward building. And finally, a friend of mine said, you know who that is? That's Emily Ett. And I said, my friend Emily Ett is that fierce woman who's <laughs> pushing those contractors around. And I went, I, I saw her and I said, Emily, I am so happy with what you have done with, yes. with our church. And I she agree. Said, she said, if I knew you were a member of that, we would have done a lot better job, Ken. And I said, well, then I wish I'd known. I mean, I don't know how they could have. They, so there's some really good stuff going I, on. I'm just following up on that, I, I don't have any... Um, hard fact evidence of this, but it's my understanding that currently if the church can't control its use, either keep it it's in, within its system and use it in some way as, as a church-owned property still, that they're hesitant to sell, say, chapels to third parties because they lose control of it. And at that point, they don't want to see a building miss that was once a sacred place to be used as, a, as something else. So the old, the old I think that's the reason that yeah, I think that's the reason that they, Scott, you can chime in on this, but I think that's the reason they lost that second chapel in Hiram. Well, uh, well, the first chapel was, uh, it was sold to the city and the city sold it to a private residence. 
and that's that's now a private residence. So when you're referring to the old first ward, uh, a lot of people tried to save it, but the, again, the the church just felt like uh, they wanted a modern building. They they talked about heating and stuff, and, and that was a real landmark. When we redesigned downtown, we used the architectural. Uh, design of that church to pattern after the new library museum in the city hall. So we were real sad we lost that. It, it's a parking lot now, and then I think they eventually sold it to build a home on it. But hey, Brad, the, when, when was the old K Street Chapel built? The one that was demolished 15, 20 years ago? Do you know? No, I can't. I, I'm trying to think what building you're referring to. It, there, and, there was a, it was a, it's a building on First Avenue. No, 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 no. That's that's the twenty first board. Uh, yeah. This was this is a oh. K Street, which is probably nineteen thirties. I mean, it's not that old. It was torn down probably in the twenty first century. I I can't speak to that. I, I yeah. don't know. I'm sure others might. It may you know maybe and, it wasn't old enough to be historic yet. I don't know. But um, there's some very but, nice houses there now. But the, the one is of gone. the things one of the things I've been trying to encourage the LDS Church to do, and you know, as a previous ship old state preservation officer and director of state history they at least take my meetings but one of the things i'm urging them to think about is that the church is doing all this missionary work now where they could put missionaries in them and then they also have non-geographic wards wards like the japanese ward or the spanish wards they're they're ethnic based wards and they're not anchored to a geographical area and so i i just said could you be more creative in assisting them and using these buildings by the church in other ways. But the other thing I'm worried about is, is uh, they could sell them and put big apartments or not appropriate uh, things inside otherwise really beautiful neighborhoods that have now all been uh, you know, recharged and turned into very nice neighborhoods. And maybe the word I should say is gentrified. But destroying those buildings and doing other developments could be harmful. So I've also, urge them to be more involved with the neighborhoods. Uh, it's very hard for the church not to get away from its private land concept. Or, you know, we own this land, we can do what we want. And I just said, please, uh, challenge them to be involved with the neighborhoods, involving them early. Because as I mentioned before, there's a five-year plan that, uh, that state presidents and bishops do, and they'll make a determination of about a building and no one in the neighborhood will know until it's at the 11th hour. And so the church has to take another stand engaging the community and not just considering it entirely something of their choosing. Brad, I have a question for you. Are you familiar with the Wellsville Tabernacle? Yes. Because this, yeah. well, after, after uh, they tore down the Colville Tabernacle, there was a proposal to tear down the Wellsville uh, tabernacle. And I remember that. That was a blood feud. People uh, went after each other physically. There was so much emotion attached to that. And I think they resolved it eventually by just selling it to uh, Wellsville City as a, as a civic center, but it's still standing. There were also uh, two buildings in uh, Spring City that uh, Peter Goss, I think, could probably talk about as well. Well, you all know I'm in a, an old ward chapel. Yeah, That's true. Old, uh, <laughs> Colonel Swin. Can you someone else invite, uh, invite us on the uh, church's uh, stand on the old Hotel Utah, turning it into uh, the Joseph Smith Building? Remember the people uh, held hands around the building to keep it from being destroyed. What was, <laughs> yeah. the, what was the setting there? Do you have any information on that? Mm -hmm. Brad, do you know about that? Well, I would only say that uh, it was uh, the church bureaucracy saved the building because they were growing so big they needed more office space for it. But it, it, it's even hard for me still to walk into that building and still not think of it as the old Hotel Utah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Well, we, we, uh, we could probably go on all night, uh, everybody. What a, what a lovely evening, uh, Joe. And Jill and Alan, we should have introduced you. Uh, what a wonderful uh, narration of those movies, Joe. What a wonderful job, Jill. What a wonderful job. It's been it's been wonderful for me. You know, I mean, it's fun to know your relationship, the Heritage Foundation, your brother's relationship, Joe. 
uh, I grew up across the street from Junior Benus, who was a protege of, of all things. And, and it's been fun for me to get to know Alan because uh, I heard so much about Alf growing up. Uh, um, so, you know, this is just uh, Utah history, wonderful, uh, and thanks so much. Uh, next month, for a, a special Christmas treat, as we always have, we're going to have Brad Westwood come and uh, give us a little snippet of his new series. What do you call them? You call them podcasts? What do you call them, Brad? Well, it, it's a, it, it, it's a, a blog. It's a 33-part blog. It's called Salt Lake West Side Stories. Uh, the Pioneer Park Coalition approached our department two years ago, and they said, we have a wonderful history of the park. And they'd keep making this statement. And finally, the administration kind of quietly said, we don't know what the hell our history is. We know we had people living around here from you know, that were Japanese and Greek and Italian, but we really don't know the story. And so we put a committee together, and my tooth here is on that committee representing the Greek community, and it has blossomed into a, uh, a, a way that people can read once a week for 20 minutes something about the West Side. But it's not just the West Side, it's the history of Utah, and yeah. it also speaks to a vibrant, uh, very rich and diverse community that sadly no longer exists, or what little does exist needs to be preserved. Brett, Brett, Brett you need, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I'm just gonna say, I, 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 uh, I'll be doing a presentation on the history of the, the community between the two railroad stations in West Side Salt Lake. So that's just wonderful. I wanna know if, if there are sharks and jets in Salt Lake's West Side story. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Sorry, can I, sorry, can sorry. I say something before we leave, too? Please, please do, Ed. Uh, I don't know how many of you heard of the second martyrdom of uh, Parley P. Pratt, but uh, yesterday <laughs> a semi truck ran through my monument, which was on 21st South and 23rd East. Oh, and that, the police said that truck uh, lost its brakes coming down Parley's Canyon, which is ironic. What? And where did it land? Right on the statue of Parley P. Pratt. That's horrible. That makes but me he, sick to my... No, it's, it's actually salvageable. So that, oh, oh, that yeah. truck hit that the uh, base, the, the plinth, which was made out of huge boulders, and those boulders just exploded, but they absorbed the shock of the truck and stopped it. Yeah. That if if it hadn't done that, I think that truck would have been run right across that shopping center parking lot and possibly right through the front of that building. They said it was going probably eighty miles an hour when it got down to that corner, so Anyway, we I went down today and we salvaged the piece, and I think we can repair the monument. It hit it so hard it just flew off, and it and it uh, landed in a way that we can probably repair it and restore that park. But that's a great park because that's part of the old Lincoln Highway. But I just thought you might enjoy that little tidbit about the second martyrdom of Parley P. Pratt. My son said, well, let's hope it's the last. And I said, well, no, I'm going to repair it. They're going to rebuild it, so maybe it'll happen again. So Parley's out there as a guardian angel on that corner protecting this. Ed, I'll bet you never thought of Parley as a man of flight. Well, he, <laughs> that's true, but he must be a guardian angel of some sort, looking <laughs> down and helping, helping that well, poor truck driver. Th thanks, Ed. That is, that is uh, that's uh, bad news, good news. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining Ken, us. Ken, before you go, please. Uh, our dues yeah. due, and it's how much, and can we send them to Craig now? Uh, uh, Please, you Let's know, get our we, dues we, paid. Good, th thank you very much, Steve, for the good lead-in. Uh, and and uh, I know everybody's tired. It's time to pack up. Uh, uh, we're doing we're doing fine financially. We actually make a little bit of money from our Alta Club meetings. Um, uh, so you know we're we don't have a lot of outflow, but we don't have a whole bunch of inflow. Be sure you know no later than the first year. Pay your dues. Forty-five bucks. Pay early. Great. If Fifty-five. You see, if you see 55. your sixty-five dollars, if you see your way clear to donating a little bit, we would love it. We we contribute to wonderful causes. 
Uh, this is really a remarkably wonderful group that I can't tell you how happy I am that Brad Westwood sponsored me however, 10, 11 years ago. Um, and a wonderful group to be a part of. And I thank you all for being a part of it. And I hope I get to see you in the next few months live and in person and give you a hug. So happy uh, Thanksgiving. Happy hey, Thanksgiving, thanks to all everybody. Of you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Great thank meeting. Thank you all. Yeah. That was super. It was super. Love you a lot.